evening. I'm Dina Mansour, Executive Director of the Maureen and Mike Mansfield Center. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our first take, uh, one of a series of conversations that we hold to provide a rapid response to current events in, in uh, the world today. Uh, we are truly honored to present this first take today. This is actually our last event for 2023 after a vibrant series of activities celebrating the 40th anniversary of the Mansfield Center. Um, we have been honored to have thousands of you join us, uh, both virtually and in person, for a range of talks, including a cabinet minister from Japan to uh, former Representative Liz Cheney. And we rely deeply on our community to carry out this mission to foster globally minded leaders of integrity with a focus on our democratic institutions and global mutual understanding, especially with Asia. So if you or anyone you might know could be a subject expert for something you'd like to hear about in a first take, uh, please message me in the chat box or email me through our website. Uh, as I mentioned, this is the last event for the spring or for the fall. We have an exciting lineup uh, for spring that we'll be announcing in mid-January. Uh, one teaser is that we will have author Peter Hessler here on April 3rd. So um, look him up. He's a fantastic writer on China and the Middle East. Um, and we're truly honored that he has chosen to visit the Mansfield Center in Missoula um, this spring. And it will also be live on Zoom. So I want to flag that, uh, as you know, when you register, you can pose a question. Our speakers have woven the answers to those questions throughout their presentation, but we also encourage you to include your questions in the Q&A box, as we'll have a specific question and answer period at the end of their prepared remarks. So I'm honored to introduce our main speaker tonight, Robert McCoy. Uh, he writes and speaks on geopolitical events and international affairs in East Asia, particularly in North Korea and its relations with other players in the region. During a 20 year career in the US Air Force as an intelligence professional, he lived in East Asia for more than 14 years. Since that time, he has published over 150 political analyses and commentaries on journals related to Asia and has been interviewed by numerous news outlets and, foreign and cited by foreign government. Our moderator today is Dr. Stephen Levine. He writes and lectures on Chinese history and politics and U.S.-China relations. During a 40-year teaching career, he taught at American University, Columbia University, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and here at the University of Montana. He has written, co-authored, edited, and translated from Chinese and Russian some dozen books in his field of interest, as well as published scores of journal articles, book chapters, and review essays. He is a critical member of the Mansfield Center team, having previously served as associate director and now as a key advisor as a senior Mansfield fellow. So I thank both of them for joining us today. And Steve, I will turn it over to you. And Steve, I'll note that you are muted. If you could turn on your microphone, please. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Hello? Okay, all right. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with colleagues of the Mansfield Center, particularly with Bob McCoy, who is my teacher when it comes to things Korean, by the way. So uh, it's a pairing that has started over at lunches, many lunches in, in, in Missoula over co Korean affairs. The question that we have to face now is with a, a world at war, wars in the Middle East, wars in Ukraine and elsewhere as well, why is it that we should turn our attention once again to Korea? And the reason is that the issues that we have been dealing with, as you will see in a while, have been brewing for dec literally decades. This evening's presentation is, is going to focus on the most recent element in which why North Korea has come into the news again. And Bob McCoy is going to remind us a little bit of background first as to how we got to where we are at this point. So Bob, if you will take it away from now and I will intersperse questions for you as we go along. Okay. <clears throat> first, let me express my gratitude for the ability to speak in this first take. My thanks to the Mansfield Center, specifically Dina for having the, the courage and the foresight to bring this to the the attention of the general community, also to Sarah and Max, who are helping us on the technological end. Uh, it's not my forte any longer. And to you, Steve, my good friend and uh, mentor colleague, um, I'm ready, so let's go. 
Well, I think we want, you know, we're going to start with some background information. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Let's begin, uh, Max, with the next slide. We'll start off with some uh, relevant location data. You can see here the tan, the light tan is uh, China, the eastern coast of China. The yellow above is the maritime uh, province of Russia. Uh, the darker tan is Japan. Korea is in the purple. The lighter purple above is North Korea, DPRK, Democratic People's Republic of Korea and the darker purple to the south is the Republic of Korea, commonly called the South Korea. Now you can see the square box there indicating uh, Pyongyang, its uh, capital, North Korea's capital, as well as the uh, box showing Seoul, some other critical series there, uh, cities there too. And just by the way, uh, Pyongyang, the capital of North Korea is about 5,500 miles away from here. And we will see a little bit later when I discuss it, that that is well within the range of uh, North Korean missiles. So Max, if we could have the next slide. The reason we're concerned about this is North Korea has uh, engaged in six nuclear tests. The last one of which was in September, seven years ago. And it had uh, a, a yield of over 140 kilotons. Um, now the scientist has sort of coalesced around the value of 250 kilotons of that seems to be the consensus. That is more than 10 times the power of the bombs that we dropped on either Nagasaki or Hiroshima. Uh, those, uh, the, those yields indicate clearly to most people that this is a true thermonuclear weapon. Uh, it's not merely an atomic bomb like we dropped back in 1945. This thing has a lot of power. So now if we can choose the next slide. These red lines are curved because of the curvature of the Earth. It's going over the pole and then down through the equator and all that. We can see North Korea pretty much in the center in the red outline there. And you can see the various ranges of the different missiles. The two that I want to point out to you are in the uh, lower right-hand corner. The Hwasong-14 has a 10 kilometer, 10,000 kilometer range. That's roughly 6,000 miles. And you can see that that will reach just about all of the United States except south of St. Louis, southeast of St. Louis uh, and Washington, D.C. However, a later missile, the Hwasong-15, can reach 13,000 kilometers. That's, uh, gee whiz, almost 9,000 miles. And all of the United States is within the targeting range. So now we can understand that since all of South Korea, all of Japan, all of, of the United States and its allies, Pacific theater military bases, and many of our allies are in within range of North Korean missiles along with the United States. We have reason to be concerned. Uh, there are some caveats about that, but I think it doesn't do us any good if we ignore the potential threat that is just over the horizon. So I think now that we have a good understanding of why we ought to be paying some attention to North Korea. I'll turn it back to you, Steve. Okay, the question then, Bob, really is why are we meeting this evening then, since this information about the missiles and development has been known for a long time, what's new? What's been in the news recently that many people may not have even noticed because of all the focus on the Middle East and Ukraine? Well, um, I wanna start out with uh, what has happened and then we can get into the analysis a bit. Um, this latest North Korean satellite is a very important development. It was launched on the 21st of December in the late evening. That's uh, not quite seven o'clock in the morning the next day, Wednesday, uh, not quite two weeks ago, our time. Now, they were successfully launched their Mali Gyeong uh, 1 satellite. Mali Gyeong means uh, 10,000 Li uh, lenses. Uh, that means about... Uh, 3,000 miles they intend this thing, or they named it, to reach. We don't know uh, whether it's got that capability, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, it was launched from the SOHA uh, Satellite Launch Facility. If we could go to the next slide, uh, Max, we can talk about that a little bit. There we go. 
you can see Soha Satellite Launching Station. There's Pyongyang. And it's noteworthy to see where Seoul is in South Korea. That's going to be a very important part of our discussion a little bit later. But the satellite was launched from Soha. Uh, and that's the accomplishment. We can talk a bit more about the details in a little bit. Uh, but it's been making, to switch to your original question, Steve, uh, it's been in the making for quite some time. Uh, it didn't happen overnight. There's a history behind this. Uh, seven or eight years ago, uh, actually much longer than that, uh, North Korea had a series of failed launches. We don't need to go into the details because tonight's not a history lesson. But three times uh, it took for this satellite to be successful. The first one was uh, in March of this year earlier, and then another one in August. Both failed because the launch vehicle, the Cholema-1 uh, space launch vehicle, uh, had failures. And it was, this was coming, this portion was coming in from six years ago. North Korea made a statement six years ago, about which I wrote a brief article, uh, in which they claimed that they were going to launch two satellites, the first of which was going to be, let me quote it here, Earth Remote Exploration Satellite. That's a direct quote. And what they have done now is they've talked about it being a military reconnaissance satellite. So what they're going to be doing is collecting photographic intelligence, FODINT, as we call it in, in the business. Uh, and it's presumably to collect uh, military tactical and strategic information. I'll get into that a little bit later. Tactical means real-time operational type usage. Strategic means planning for wars or conflicts or other exigencies that may occur in the future. The second satellite that uh, the North Koreans promised to launch was uh, to be let me get the quote here, communications satellite. It was going to be in a geosynchronous uh, orbit uh, at the e equator. Now, what that means is a satellite uh, will hover over one spot of the Earth at the equatorial level and allow it to uh, survey a wide range of things. And presumably, they're going to position it. Uh, it's going to be further way out into space. Uh, they can monitor either the United States or other countries of interest and also be able to see line of sight communications back to the North Korean peninsula. Um, now, what that is going to do is give them uh, targeting information, uh, communicate with the missile as well. Uh, let me back up and explain that a little bit better. We're going to get telemetry from that uh, North Korean missile launches. They haven't been able to do that lately. While the satellite or while the, the missile is in the air, it will be communicating back to the ground, sending performance data. That data is going to be monitored all the way as that missile cruises to impact through this satellite. And it will advise the North Korean satellite people how well the missile performed and where it actually went. On the other hand, once they get things tested out and they don't need the uh, performance data anymore, that will allow for in-course corrections if they choose to launch at Washington, D.C., the White House, for example, they could in-flight correct it to the Pentagon or New York City, for example, if they do it soon enough. So they allow uh, this second satellite, which has not yet been launched, but which is intended, uh, will allow them to do that. So, uh, it was a charm. The third time was a charm. It was the third time that was a success. And they did this mostly uh, with uh, confiscated and uh, surreptitiously uh, gained uh, Soviet missile technology. They use an engine called the RD-40 for much of their rocketry. And they've configured it slightly differently. They've reversed engineered it. They've improved it. They gang two or more of them together to improve thrust. And they have reached a point where they can now throw their missiles uh, 9,000 plus miles uh, away, and they can put a satellite uh, into the air. Now, I doubt that the Russians provided them equipment outright, but the original RD-40 engines are thought to come from rogue engineers in uh, Ukraine. And of course, they paid a pretty penny for those. They were glad to have them. But the recent uh, confab between Putin, uh, Vladimir Putin of Russia, and Kim Jong-un of North Korea 
probably started some consultations. We do know that the North Koreans provided the Russians with schematics and uh, data uh, for this latest launch long before it was uh, launched, uh, several weeks before that. And the Russians are thought to have provided advice and guidance, uh, a critique, would you, uh, if you want, of what the North Koreans had planned. Now it would be, it would have been too late for them to change any equipment, but they could certainly tweak the software to improve uh, what that might have been. Now, why would the North, why would the Russians do this? Well, it's clear that during this confab, they discussed sending munitions. And other news reports say that North Korea has provided at least 1 million artillery shells and other types of munitions uh, to the Russians for use in their war against Ukraine. So that's the quid pro quo, missile technology, missile advent, uh, uh, advice um, and guidance for the artillery shells. There are other things that Russia could get out of this, but that's not the subject of this particular uh, presentation. So we have that. The satellite itself is 660 pounds. That's a huge monster uh, by anyone's standards for a first lifting up. Uh, it began circling the globe uh, shortly uh, after launch. It took it less than 12 minutes to reach orbit. Uh, and it's at an altitude of just over 300 miles. That's fairly standard, along with the time needed to reach orbit. Uh, and it's uh, at a, it's in a low Earth orbit that's not quite polar. If we could go to the next slide, uh, we can see what this is about. That's the missile itself. Notice the bulbous nose on this uh, uh, missile. The, the missile launcher itself is the Cholima-1. That means 10,000 Li's, uh, an old Chinese measure. It's a, the Koreans love the word uh, 1,000 and they love the word 10,000. So they figure prominently in their names. The big bulbous thing is the housing for the satellite itself. And this picture is provided by the Korean Central News Agency out of Pyongyang, North Korea, as the missile and satellite is being erected to a vertical position just prior to launch. So if we could get the next uh, picture too. There we go. Um, there's that polar orbit that I mentioned and the equatorial orbit that I mentioned. I'm going to explain those. The equatorial orbit is usually further out in space. It's necessary in order to allow it to stay fixed position over one a spot. And it will probably be somewhere in the Pacific that allows it to monitor both the United States as well as maintaining light of sight communications with North Korea. The polar orbit is the most efficient way to cover uh, the entire globe. Every time the satellite makes a, a rotational turn, 95 minutes from North Pole down to the South Pole and around the backside, uh, it covers a portion of the Earth, and then as the Earth rotates, uh, it allows that satellite on the next pass to cover an additional 22 degrees. What that means is you can cover the entire Earth in slightly more than 26 hours. Polar orbits, though, are, take a great deal of energy, and they typically are angled as the green line there shows. Uh, that green line is in a direction different from what the North Koreans have done and at a different angle. And in fact, it would be helpful if the viewers here were to imagine the Earth being a face of a clock. Position yourself at the 11 o'clock number, and that's where the North Korean satellite will come over the horizon. It will then travel south-southeast to the 5 o'clock position and disappear behind the Earth as it goes around. Now, it's interesting uh, that 300 miles up puts that satellite, satellite above most of the Earth's atmosphere. So we don't have to worry about it, a satellite friction causing a drag and eventually for it to be pulled down into the atmosphere, a major atmosphere and burn up. Uh, that's not going to happen with this site, uh, this satellite. And so 22 degrees, uh, the issue is what equipment is on board that North Korean satellite. We don't have a handle on that yet. We're fairly certain that it contains optics uh, optics indicating that it's not uh, what you would call up to United States standards, but I'll get into the details of that a little bit. And we don't want to take a great deal of comfort by realizing it's not American standards. That's 
really not what we need to be thinking about. Uh, the satellite is more than likely a visible light spectrum only, meaning that if there are clouds or on the backside where there's no sun, there aren't going to be any pictures, although they might be able to get uh, visible lights from major metropolitan cities. That's not going to help them much, though. Uh, what they're going to do is, is stick with visible light, we think, unless they have uh, put on board infrared. Now, that takes a lot more of equipment, and 660 pounds might be able to handle that, but we just don't know as yet. Uh, to give you, give you some comparisons, uh, the very first Earth artificial Earth satellite was Sputnik 1, and it was launched one day before my birthday in 1957. It weighed 184 pounds, and it had very limited capability. It was some time later that the United States got that capability, and that was on the 8th of February the next year in 58, and our satellite weighed 33 pounds. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me to learn if I were to go back and read the history that it was just a basketball size object thrown up uh, with a beeper on it that we could say, yes, yeah, something's being sent back to the United States. But uh, North Koreans claim that the uh, satellite is functioning and that Kim Jong-un has viewed photographs from it. We need to be careful of that statement though, because it usually takes a few days uh, to calibrate the cameras, check the resolution, get things set up, the focal length uh, fixed where they need it, and establish reliable communications. Well, it's been two weeks, and it's only uh, after seven days that they started talking about that. If we could go to the next slide then, uh, this is a, it's a representational picture of what a modern satellite looks like. Earlier uh, North Korean satellites were kind of boxy in shape. Uh, this one is cylindrical. We really don't know yet until we get some photographs of it or the North Koreans release uh, some indicators. But you can see the solar panels here extended to gather uh, sunlit energy to power the machine. And that's going to be very important. We will see uh, just what happens when they get around to releasing those uh, photographs. So shall we continue, Steve? Yeah, I have a quick question, if I might. Do all the nuclear powers then have satellites in, in orbits like the North Koreans have now? You know, I haven't, you happen into, to know? I haven't looked into, uh, well, India certainly does. I don't know if Pakistan does. I haven't paid much attention to that. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, uh, Japan does and South Korea does. Neither of those are nuclear powers. Uh, right. Iran, I haven't paid much attention to them. They're, they're a bit out of my bailiwick, but the you know, Soviet Union and China, certainly Russia these days, not Soviet Union, but Russia and China certainly have uh, satellites on board as well as the United States. So it seems to me it's really quite an extraordinary accomplishment for a country like North Korea then, a little well, bit later in the game to be sure, to have done to have done what it's done. Yes, and it's not getting uh, what Kim Jong-un would call proper respect. Uh, the Japanese government, for example, poo-pooed it initially, saying they're not even sure that it was a successful launch. And the South Koreans have poo-pooed the optical quality. This is based on stuff that they recovered from one of the uh, crashes of the failed Cholima launch vehicle uh, earlier this year. And they found that the lens was uh, had an N on it, which is leading us to believe it's Nikon. They also claim there were a number of contraband parts on board, uh, thus indicating as well that some of the parts were uh, brought in despite the sanctions. But after a considerable amount of thought, the South Koreans have finally admitted that the resolution uh, of their camera, that lens, along with its ex necessary extender, would still be in the five meter range, uh, possibly uh, a three meter range, a couple of South Korean sources have said. To put that into the British system, we're talking about a 16 foot resolution or a 10 foot resolution. Mm. Both of those, now I had estimated back in 2017 that a, the resolution on any spy satellite by the North Koreans would be under 10 meters, less than 33 feet. That would have been big enough to catch a school bus or a tank, something of that nature. If we get down to the five or uh, three meter 
size, that's certainly no bigger than an automobile or a Jeep, something of that nature. A self-propelled howitzer clearly is going to be uh, discernible. A massed troop movements, all of these things are going to be uh, discernible with a five or three meter resolution. By comparison, and we shouldn't take any comfort at this, and I'll explain why, uh, in 1966, it is now known that the American satellites in the Keyhole uh, program uh, had two inch resolution, two inches, mm. as opposed to 16 feet or 10 feet. So North Koreans don't need that. And I'll explain why. Uh, oh, but before I do that, I want to explain that China has been remarkably quiet on this. And that tells me that they either tacitly approve or have reluctantly accepted uh, what their little brother has been able to accomplish. Now, the United States, some of the commercial outlets have uh, not been terribly, uh, oh, what's the word? I'm struggling to say it nicely. <laughs> they haven't been too impressed. However, a number of professional Korean watching sites, uh, one of which is my favorite, it's called 38 North uh, website, says it's a very nice first try. Their exact words were a modest first effort. Well, some might say that's damning by first uh, faint praise, but it's not. Uh, let's consider what needs to be done if they're launching a nuclear weapon. Uh, and of course, that brings up the next question. Well, just how good is this? Uh, do we really need to worry about that? That's what I'm getting to. Uh, if it's the 33 feet thing that I estimated, and I think I've been proven uh, too uh, conservative, down to 15, uh, 16 feet, 10 feet, even better maybe. And we certainly know that things are going to improve over time as uh, Kim launches more and more satellites as he's uh, promised, that we really need to pay attention. Uh, the example I'm going to give is depending upon the yield of the nuclear weapon being thrown about, uh, if it's a tactical nuke, it's going to be detonated in the air. If you let it hit the ground, you're going to blow a big hole, do tremendous amount of damage, but it's not going to have much of a radius. So uh, nuclear weapons tend to be airburst, just like we did over uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. For low yield tactical nukes, the one altitude is around 700 feet. Uh, for higher yield, it could be as high as 15,000 feet. And that would be an electromagnetic pulse vehicle to take out some of our communications and our uh, electrical grid. Well, my point in mentioning these is if let's say that we have a electrical power hub in Boise, Idaho, somewhere on the Snake River somewhere, that 16 feet error isn't going to make a darn bit of difference. It's simply ludicrous to think it would. If it's targeting the center ring of the Pentagon, 16 feet at 15,000 feet or even seven, uh, 15, yeah, 15,000 feet or 700 feet isn't going to make any difference. We need to be uh, careful of being overconfident and gloating about uh, their apparent lack of resolution. It's worrisome. It should be. So, but we also need to be aware that these are targeting resolutions. They're the resolutions of the North Korean uh, satellites. We don't know what the accuracy is of their missiles, and we won't know that for quite some time. Uh, North Korea has tested its Hwasong ICBMs a, a couple, number of times, but they've done so on a lofted uh, trajectory, and they've done that for two reasons. Uh, they want to avoid overflight of Japan, which throws a hissy fit every time that happens. It's a big deal to them. They don't want to overfly South Korea. Same reaction there. It brings unwanted uh, attention and condemnation uh, to the North. Instead, they loft it at a very high angle, almost straight up. And so the missile goes way, way up into the air, uh, lands just a few hundred feet, a few hundred miles off the coast into the waters. Uh, and presumably they're testing their nose cone and other devices during the descent, which can be pretty tough on equipment. But it also allows them to prevent others from recovering uh, their material to analyze and get a better idea of what their equipment capabilities are. So until the North launches 
a nuclear missile and actually detonates it in the air successfully somewhere in the South Pacific, we aren't going to know exactly what their capabilities are. We don't know if uh, the missile is accurate, if it can get it within 16 feet. Uh, we don't know uh, if the re-entry vehicle, vehicle will adequately protect uh, the nuclear bomb and its detonation device. We don't know if the detonation device will function after being thrust several Gs into the air and then uh, enduring the, the buck, bucketing, buffeting and heat of reentry. These are questions that we need to pay attention to. Nonetheless, I think we need to be concerned. Now, one of the things that you and I in past discussions have mentioned is why don't we just take this out? In fact, we might want to go to the next slide on this. Can I ask a quick, quick, quick question here, though, Bob? Do the experts expect the North Koreans at some point in the near future to test a, another nuclear weapon so that they can do a trajectory that would be more realistic if they were going to invade, let's say, attack Guam or the United States West Coast? What is well, the scuttlebutt among the experts on that? People are prepared for that. There, some months ago, there was activity around their uh, known nuclear test site. Uh, people were starting to think they haven't tested their detonators. That is something that has to be done. Uh, atom bombs work by imploding and compressing non-critical masses of nuclear material into a mass that is critical that causes the explosive uh, reaction. Those detonators have to function purpose, uh, perfectly and those haven't been tested to my knowledge. There have been two new tunnels or at least two different areas of their uh, nuclear test site that have been worked on uh, this year, but we've had they've had some setbacks, I think, because uh, there have been some earthquakes in that area naturally caused, not we were able to determine that. And that yeah. might have messed up their tunneling and things. And I would expect that they would need to continue to test their miniature miniaturization of their nuclear devices. Uh, so we would prefer that if they're going to test them at all, they do them underground. Uh, Kim has talked loosely about doing an air detonation a couple of times in the past, uh, a year or so ago. So I would say that that is a possibility. Probability, perhaps not. But even so, they still need to launch a missile uh, in a normal trajectory to test things. They could have a dummy warhead to see if the detonators work. Uh, wouldn't have to be a nuclear fuel or nuclear fizzle material, but they mm -hmm. can do that. And if the missile is as accurate as it seems to be possible, then they could have a ship in the general area, the submarine to uh, recover those materials uh, quickly to prevent uh, people like the United States or other uh, to get to it and analyze it. So. Um, any other things that you would like? To, I think we. Yeah, I mean, the, the point though seems to be that these fo these folks have been in the business now for decades doing this, and so they know what they're doing and probably are. I'm pursuing sorry, a pattern I'm that other nuclear powers. It. Yeah, I'm saying that they they've been in the business a very long time doing these kinds of miss, both missile development and and the nuclear weapons. So the pattern that they're following is not something they're inventing. They're doing something that others have done before them. It That's seems correct. to be an irrational method. Yes. It's okay, a, anyway. Go yeah. ahead. Go ahead, please. Okay. Well, well, back to you. Okay. Uh, that seems to be the, the, the normal path. Uh, it's an accelerated path because the others have gone before them and they have either somehow acquired uh, the necessary technology through surreptitious means or they've stolen it. Somehow they've gotten the necessary steps and they, they've made a tremendous strides in the few years that they've recently been at this. Uh, it's not like the Americans Manhattan Project, which was 24 seven. I mean, it was uh, pedal to the metal intense. Uh, they've had years to do this and it's not surprising uh, that they're there where they are. Now, 
This slide here shows Kim standing on the floor of the uh, Space Administration's Technology Center. And the three screens in the back are purported to show uh, some satellite images of the South Korean uh, peninsula. Uh, you'll notice that they're not sharp. Uh, these could be some initial photographs, if indeed they are from the satellite. As I said, they need some fine tuning uh, to get everything working properly. I would not dismiss this out of hand as being uh, inadequate for a military purpose, as uh, some commercial outlets have said. Uh, but going back to the capabilities of the satellite, I want to point something out. This satellite can be useful uh, for a number of things. Uh, one, not only will it show massing of troops and the gathering of equipment in preparation for some sort of military operation, uh, the other side of the coin would, would be if it shows nothing, then that should be reassuring uh, to the North Koreans that they are, at least for the short time, in the near term, free from any impending attack from the United States or uh, South Korea. And that should uh, ratchet down tensions a little bit. The ability to look and see these sorts of things. Can you imagine if Iran had been able to see the sixth month buildup that the United States engaged in before Operation Desert Storm? I mean, we took our time, <clears throat> excuse me, six months to get the equipment in place and finally launch an operation that conquered a country in less than a week. Uh, North Korea now has a satellite to sort of force our hand on that. We don't have six month, months in which uh, to prepare. We decided to yeah. attack North Korea. But that brings up the next question. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. This is a slide that uh, I've used before in other presentations about North Korea. Each of these red dots represent a North Korean weapons system pointed at Seoul. Seoul is in the multicolored area. Uh, the colors represent population densities. The DMZ is the solid uh, reddish line that goes roughly across the peninsula there. Each of the dots represent a hardened artillery site. That's what HARTS stands for, hardened artillery site. Uh, and if not an artillery site, then multiple tube rocket launchers, as well as short range missiles. That is why uh, it's probably impossible for the United States to engage in a preemptive uh, or preventive attack. We would not only need to be sure to take out all of North Koreans missiles and uh, nuclear uh, plants uh, program uh, facilities, we would concurrently, and I stress this, concurrently need to neutralize all of these 6,000 systems along the DMZ. I doubt that we have the capability, let alone the political will. And if we didn't take out these uh, 6,000 plus uh, artillery, rocket, and missile sites along the DMZ, uh, North Korea uh, would wipe out half of the South Korean population, 50% of the South Korean population lives in Kyunggi province, which is greater Seoul. Uh, you can see Seoul there spreads out to the north and to the northwest, uh, somewhat to the east, a lot to the south, Incheon to the coast. All of those population centers would be within the range of these 6,000 uh, defensive positions. So would we risk that? I think not. Uh, but we need to also be careful about focusing on nuclear weapons. Uh, you and I have, have talked in the past many times over lunch and in formal settings. Nuclear weapons are not the only weapons of mass destruction uh, that North Korea could em employ. They have chemical weapons. Uh, that's how Kim Jong-un was able to assassinate his half-brother in Kuala Lumpur some years back using VX, a very deadly weapon. They also have sarin and others. They have biological weapons as well. And they have this little biplane called an AN-2, made mostly of wood, except for the engine. It flies very low and very slow. And most American radars and our allies too have been tuned to ignore them because they approximate the speed and density of flocks of birds. And the Americans and their allies are tired of false positives. They don't want to be bothered by that. 
Well, if you've got an AN2 filled with, say, 2,000 pounds of anthrax or some other nasty biological weapon flying through down the corridors of downtown Seoul during rush hour and release that, the ensuing panic would overwhelm the medical system. It would overwhelm first responders. It would be devastating. So those are things that we also need to be concerned about. Um, any further questions? Yeah, so it, it seems no. So it, just a, a very brief comment then. It seems that the North Koreans have a redundancy capability of redundancy in many different forms to deter any kind of a attack against them. The the question then, in my mind, is what is the implications for the United States? Uh, Washington is a lot farther away than Seoul is from Pyongyang or the launch sites. I can see that the that the South Koreans are in permanent jeopardy in terms of their neighbor. But what are, what are the implications of this latest development in the United States? Well, they could- Is target... it cause for- no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, no, I, I, should we be more worried now than we were two weeks ago, let's say? Incrementally, yes. Uh, should people stay up at night worrying? Should they invest in bomb shelters, survival supplies? No. Uh, one of the questions that I was given earlier from an earlier registrant uh, is, uh, does the North Korea have the capability to land a missile on satellite? Oh, yes, indeed. Uh, and even if that thing uh, were detonated a few miles off coast, the drift of the wind would uh, be catastrophic. San Francisco has been mentioned as, would the United States be willing to trade Seoul for San Francisco if some blackmail were involved, or if uh, worse came to worse and we protected Seoul, but North Korea retaliated by getting San Francisco. Yes, a dirty bomb, even if the detonator device uh, didn't work and we had uh, several pounds of radioactive, highly radioactive uh, plutonium or enriched uranium scattered in the wind over say uh, Los Angeles or San Francisco, Oakland area. Uh, Northern Virginia and Washington DC area, New York City, Boston, all of these are within range of the North Korean uh, ICBMs. Now, the question that comes up that ought to give us some degree, but not total comfort, is that North Korea knows that if they were to use a nuclear weapon, it would be the end of their existence. So if it's a case of they won't do this except as a last resort, I would be willing to bet at least a hamburger uh, that if worse came to worse, North Korea would say, we're going down, we're gonna take you with us. And they would launch as many as they've got, perhaps a half a dozen or maybe a dozen or more uh, now. And we don't know if they would be able to be detected and destroyed by our missile defenses uh, at this moment. So, uh, we need to pay more attention to North Korea. We need to find a way to deal with them. Any further questions? Oh, uh, there was, there, yeah, there was well, uh, Bob, I think there were a number of questions that came in before the yes, program actually to... started. So I wonder if you could take those up. Yes, and I, maybe I get to those. people who are watching have additional questions as, as yes. they've been listening uh, to you. One person has submitted the question, elements of national power or diplomacy, <clears throat> information, Military economy, does this launch fit one of those? Well, the, the title of the, this presentation was uh, Military Reconnaissance Satellite. But if you look at the question of the missile launch with a little bit deeper lens and dig into the weeds a bit, uh, North Korea does get a bit of soft power diplomacy out of this. Look at us, we're this small country, we have done this. Mm -hmm. You should pay attention to us. We have this power. That works a great deal in diplomacy. Information-wise, we will see just how accurate their data collection efforts are as to what they can do uh, with it. Uh, economically, the North Koreans aren't positioned to make use of the data for any uh, agricultural purposes or even hydroelectric uh, or uh, meteorological position, uh, weather information. They just aren't in a position to do that. So economically, no, financially, no. Uh, information depends on how good the, the uh, satellite lenses and, and things are, and certainly militarily. 
as Kim has himself explained, this is a military reconnaissance satellite. Uh, so I think that handles that question. Another question is, uh, which I just answered, uh, can you bond, can the North Koreans land the missile on Seattle? Oh, heck yes. And uh, another question, where did North Korea obtain the blueprints for this technology? Uh, by hook or crook. They, as I explained earlier, got the basic RD-40 uh, thruster rocket motors uh, from uh, rogue engineers in uh, Ukraine just after the Soviet Union broke up. Uh, and they've built on that. They have a, a homegrown capacity now. They've re-engineered things. They've modified things for their own use. They have found a way to cluster these engines together to get more power, more lifting thrust weight, uh, throw weight. And then recently they've asked the Russians for some critique or feedback on what they have done. But most of this stuff is based on equipment that they've been able to gather through surreptitious means, and then their rather prodigious uh, homegrown capacity and capabilities of building on that. Now, there's another question uh, that I'm going to get to last. Uh, the final one that I want to address is, uh, this is big news, and why haven't I heard about it before? The reason is the American media is somewhat Eurocentric, and because ostensibly the United States is a Judeo-Christian uh, society. That's changing, by the way. It's no longer strictly the case. Uh, American media seems to be Eurocentric or focused on the Middle East. Uh, that's a concern because we need to be focusing on Africa, uh, South America, where China is making some inroads. Uh, Africa has great stores of some vital minerals that are worth uh, a lot in, in making uh, technology, uh, rare earth metals, for example. And we need to be paying, paying attention to Iran uh, and North Korea, but those are not the glorious, the sexy things. What's sexy is, uh, first of all, uh, Ukraine. We've covered that fairly well at the expense of other things. And then uh, we had the October 7th uh, attack by Hamas uh, in Israel, uh, not October 7th, uh, but the recent one. Um, and so we moved on from uh, Ukraine to, to that. The American media seems to be singularly minded. It's not, despite its hundreds, if not thousands of journalists and the hundreds, if not thousands of news outlets that exist across the world, uh, it seems that they're capable of focusing only on one thing at a, at a time. And that's a bit disheartening uh, because um, the world is not going to shut down one section while uh, the United States tends to focus on another. There are ways to get around that and improve that, and that is to stop focusing upon American commercial media, which I don't consider to be worth much anyway. I use British uh, uh, BBC, for example, British Broadcasting System. Uh, a couple of them in America are good. Uh, uh, Christian Science Monitor, the uh, Telegraph, the Guardian out of Britain, uh, then there's a host of Japanese and Korean papers that not only write in a much better uh, journalistic style, uh, but they tend to be much ahead of what the Americans do if the Americans ever get to it. Then, of course, there are the think tanks that one can uh, dial into, the Rand Corporation, the Brookings Corporation, a host of others. Uh, so my advice to people that say, well, how come I don't know about this? Uh, improve your source of news. The final question is something yeah. that you have talked about, Steve, uh, many, many, many times. And the question specifically is, what are the consequences, negative and positive, would another Trump presidency uh, bring to bear on our relationship with North Korea and our national security? That is a highly, highly complex uh, question, problem that requires a very, very nuanced and detailed analysis and response. And I think it's beyond what we could get into meaningfully uh, at the end of this presentation. It would, I would be very reluctant to even mention uh, what the beginnings of my thoughts are. This is something I think we ought to uh, gin up another presentation on in the future if there's a sufficient interest. And now I see that we have uh, some another Q&A and a chat. 
So if uh, Sarah wants to jump in or something, uh, we can take a look at those. We've got about 10 minutes left, it looks like. Um, the first question, does North Korea's space intrusion have any practical impact on international agreements not to in militarize space? Uh, apparently there's a lot of space junk and useful machinery in, in orbit. Well, to answer the first part, um, North Korea has as much right as any other sovereign nation to launch a satellite. We have our own military satellites. Uh, there is nothing in international law that says they ought not or should not. The, the excuse that is used by the United States and its allies in the United Nations forum to in, impose sanctions on the North Koreans is to say that any technology that is capable of launching a satellite into space is also capable of being used for intercontinental ballistic missiles that deliver nuclear warheads. That is true, but we have nuclear warheads. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm doing here. I am not defending North Korea. I am simply saying that what's good for the goose is good for the gander, and we need to step back from things and not look at the world through American eyes. It's where we fail, because the world does not see, other parts of the world does not see the world as Americans do. They see it through their own eyes. And that's a strategic empathy capability that we seem to lack. Uh, second part of that question was, yes, there is a lot of space junk out there, as well as a lot of useful machinery. And the North Koreans are probably continuing to get the information from the Soviets and or from the Russians and from the Chinese as well. And that will continue likely until the North Koreans get their own uh, system up and running. Um, okay, there are approximately 24 countries with satellites in orbit. Not all have nuclear capabilities. That's true. But anybody that can put a satellite up uh, can launch an ICBM. Uh, we have the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which seems to have worked with all but a handful of rogue nations. It continues to fail with rogue nations. Any country that decides it is outside the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and North Korea did, in fact, in fact uh, formally abandon it, so they're free from any restrictions of that. There's a pro a, a a section of the the N, uh, the nuclear non-proliferation treaty that allows a country with proper notification to bail out if they feel threatened. North Korea does feel threatened. If I were them, I would feel threatened. And so they have bailed out of that and they have developed their own nuclear weapons. International law provides for that. We don't like it, but there is nothing illegal about it despite uh, the nasty press that they have been given uh, throughout the world. If I were in their position, I would do the same thing. Bob, just a, qu a question here now. What, you what you've been saying suggests that the international sanctions regime hasn't really worked. That there are all these nice resolutions from the United Nations prohibiting the North Koreans from doing this and doing that. But in fact, given the way the world works, which the United States does not control much as we might like it to, there will be ways around which so-called rogue nations will find the means to do what they want to do. So are the international sanctions regime just sort of decorations or do they have any significant impact upon us? I think they have a great deal of utility. <clears throat> For one, I don't think we should allow North Korea to easily achieve what it has been to achieve, been able to achieve. The sanctions make it difficult uh, and identifies the use of sanctions identifies clearly for the world to see who are those that favor the liberal world order that we all profess to admire so much. That is freedom, democracy, the ability to make a living and have the ability to move about without fear of some sort of governmental rep, uh, retribution. Uh, or if you want to engage in some sort of dictatorial things and, and surreptitious behind the scenes, illegal activities to further your own ends. So the sanctions, I think, serve a purpose. And they do make things difficult. North Korea uh, is not going to be stopped from this. It was uh, somewhat Pollyanna-ish and actually hubristic to think 
that the United States has the ability to stop another country from doing those sorts of things. It does slow them down. And for that, we can be grateful because it gives us time uh, if we had the political brain power and the political will to sit down and develop a rational, comprehensive, and viable plan with which to deal with North Korea. But these are all things that are topics for another time. Well, in fact, I think that we should have another time so that we can discuss those topics because the problem of North Korea's nuclear development and missile development has been going on for decades. And the policies we pursued under other, both Democratic and Republican presidents has not brought us any closer to a resolution of this issue. So I hope that in the future, uh, you and I and others as well, and members of the audience will be able to discuss that on another occasion. But I want to thank you very much for what was a really lucid presentation of this last development and a long chain of developments that has brought us to the point where we are now. Well, Steve, I want to thank you, Bob, and thanks everyone else who's been tuned in. Thank you, Steve. You've you've been a good mentor, a good host, and uh, a wonderful friend. So I thank you for that. My thanks also uh, to the Mansfield Center for addressing this difficult topic. Uh, Dina, in particular, Sarah, Max, behind the scenes, technology guru, making things work. Uh, thank you all, and to all a good night. Here, here. Good night.